Dr. Stephanie Sneff has been an absolute blessing. She is a wealth of information. She uh, definitely knows her stuff and gets uh, really technical sometimes, but what she is tying together with deuterium and glyphosate and just the health crisis that we're experiencing, even including uh, autism, is amazing. And I love to just to have the opportunity to visit with her and learn and share things that are really, really important. Dr. Sneff, so excited to be visiting with you again. Uh, the first conversation as we dove into uh, glyphosate and a little bit on uh, the the uh, deuterium aspects was just, it, it was wonderful. It really laid out a lot of the connections that uh, in, with the metabolic disruptions that, uh, and then some to, to say the least, but you and one of my favorite people in the entire world, Dr. Laszlo Boros uh, have a new study. And I wanted to, uh, you know, spread the awareness for that because I think it's fascinating uh, tool in our understanding for, deuterium and and the effects and a ketogenic diet so if you will just that just in case somebody doesn't know who you are that brief introduction to who you are and go into the study and the significance the importance of what y'all just put out okay sure and i want to say uh, uh, give a shout out to laszlo boros because he sent me an email blind email in december 2019 right before covid hit and he congratulated Greg Nye and me on a paper we had written, which we had a lot of fun writing. It's metabolic stuff. You know, he loves metabolism. He's really good at all the metabolic pathways. And he said, you know, great paper. And then he said, by the way, deuterium. It was basically, do you know about deuterium? And I, I was blown away because once I started, and he, and he attached a paper that he had written, which was fantastic. And it really hit, hit hard on how deuterium uh, matters. And also it fits so well with my knowledge of glyphosate and which enzymes it disrupts that I was just extremely excited. And I just dropped, you know, I sort of, every once in a while I hit a, a place where I have a huge new insight and then I just chase after it for, for years sometimes, you know. And so um, so this is what happened. So he and I are now collaborating, as you saw on this paper. I'm really excited to be collaborating with him. And and we've become friends and I've given talks at, at places where he's hosting, a, you know, a conference or something. So it's just been really, really great, a great experience working with him. And um, and he is so knowledgeable, and his knowledge is deep, and he has uh, he has knowledge beyond you know way beyond mine in terms of some of these these aspects. So I have a hard time keeping up with him, but I love that because I'm always looking to learn. I, I, I don't think I'll ever grow tired of learning more about biology, and so it's been a really fun ride, and I'm excited about this paper. Very interesting, uh, and it really it's really kind of a case study. I mean, it starts as a case study um, with his particular, and I think he works with you know, athletes, people who have a do extreme exercise, you know, and he knows how to help them be able to endure um, a strong exercise, especially in stressful situations like up high when you don't have any oxygen, you know, the oxygen is way lower up on Mount Everest than it is at, at sea level. And so you're not getting as, enough oxygen into your body if you're just breathing air, you know, you, so people often yeah. bring oxygen supplements in order to get to the top of Mount Everest. It's a really big challenge just from the standpoint of too little oxygen, which of course you need to drive the mitochondria and the mitochondria are producing the ATP, which is energizing your muscles so you can move. So you really, you know, you really depend on uh, being able to get by on less oxygen, I would say, having a way to do that. And I think that may be key uh, to why it works. Um, but this person had gone up, had tried several times, I think five times to get to the top of Mount Everest and failed every time. And each time he carved up, he carved up before he went. So he ate lots and lots of carbs, you know, um, thinking that that would give him a lot of energy. Um, and what yeah. Laszlo told him to, to do is, no, you train first for months, eating a, a high fat diet, you know, and particularly animal based fats, saturated fats and uh, what it's called um, uh, <laughs> branch chain fats, branch chain fatty acids. And uh, so when he wrote the paper, and I was branch chain, uh, so I read it, you know, he sent a draft out, and we were all critiquing it and modifying it. And I branch chain, oh, my goodness, what is that? So I didn't know what branch chain fatty acids were, you know, and he mentioned them specifically as being a really good source of energy to help you uh, and to get your body into a system where it's relying on fats instead of instead of sugar to supply fuel to the mitochondria. And, um, and in particular, branch chain. So I, that took me off on a tangent because I started reading all about branch chain fatty acids and found some very interesting things, which we can get into later. But um, but the cool thing is that the metabolism happens very differently when you have um, fat as your main source of energy. And and this, this um, 
area in the cell, these little organ organelles like the mitochondria, you know, these are organelles inside the, the cell. And there's um, this perox, let's see what, <laughs> I lost the word, I had it a moment ago. Uh, peroxisome, the peroxisome uh, is another kind of organelle inside the cell. We don't know, you know, people don't know much about the peroxisome, but that's a very mm -hmm. interesting place where fats are metabolized. See this thing here? Yeah, that's the yes. figure that we have in the paper that, um, that shows the interaction between the peroxisome and the mitochondria. And it's really fascinating biochemistry because the peroxisomes are busy metabolizing the fats. And when they do that, they produce uh, peroxide, right? Hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. And then, um, and they hand it over to the mitochondria. And then the mitochondria use catalase to convert the H2O2 into, so you have two molecules of H2O2. So each one has H2O plus O, right? So you take those two O's mm -hmm. off and you get two molecules of water and one molecule of oxygen. So they're actually, that H2O2 is supplying oxygen to the mitochondria, which is short on supply because of this thin air. So it's a, a really cool way to deliver, directly deliver oxygen to the mitochondria to help them make ATP. I think that's really a, a neat aspect of this story that he, that we talk about in the paper. So, um, so the peroxisome is collaborating with the mitochondria and to take some of the load off of the mitochondria because they're, you know, the mitochondria are trying to work really hard. They don't have enough oxygen. They're going to, they're going to be in trouble. And of course, if, if on top of that, there's too much deuterium because deuterium mm -hmm. is really nasty in the mitochondria. And this is the thing that he drove home to me back when he first introduced himself. Uh, the mitochondria hate deuterium because uh, deuterium, by the way, is heavy hydrogen. We need to back up here a bit. <laughs> hydrogen and deuterium, right? They're almost the same thing, but deuterium has an extra neutron, which makes it twice as heavy. It's a natural element. It's found in seawater at 156 parts per million. And it's, um, and it's all over. It's in the water. It's in the food. It's everywhere. It's natural. It's not like it's a, a toxin or anything. It's a natural element. And the um, metabolism has learned how to deal with it very beautifully. We have lots of enzymes that play a role in keeping deuterium out of the mitochondria. And that's what's so fascinating to me, the whole biochemistry of that. And part of that is trapping deuterium in the uh, extracellular matrix. So I believe the collagen molecules outside the cell are trapping deuterium in their prolines. And they're also trapping deuterium in gelled water that they form because of their sulfate. So there's all this interesting stuff that's going on, mm. all of which is disrupted by glyphosate. So, so the deuterium gets trapped outside the cell. And then those, the gelled water pushes protons out into the, into the blood. So those protons are going to be depleted in deuterium because the deuterium is left behind in the gel. So this is how you keep the blood, the, the water in the blood low in deuterium. And then eventually that, that water makes its way into the mitochondria and that's also low in deuterium. But then there's also these microbes who are heroes in the gut. And those microbes produce, uh, we're getting into a lot of stuff here. I don't know if you're following it all, but those microbes produce the short yeah. chain fatty acids in the gut. There's three of them. Uh, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And those are super, super yeah. important in the gut. And those are actually, uh, so those are produced by the microbes, not by the human cells. And then those are used to make fatty acids, to make fats, you know. They're the precursors of fats. So that's why fats, and then the reason why fats have very low deuterium, this is the really super important thing. Eating butter, lard, um, you know, animal-based fats, probably coconut oil as well. So some of the saturated fats in particular. Uh, Animal-based saturated fats are super good. Butter is amazing, and it has a lot of butyrate, which actually came from the microbes. So that, and, of course, it comes from milk, and, and milk actually has low deuterium. So it's um, the, the mother is feeding her infant low deuterium milk, you know, a yeah. human uh, breast milk. And so uh, this whole system with the microbes is incredibly important for making deuterium-depleted fats which then if you eat those on a regular basis, you've, you've lessened the deuterium load in your mitochondria, which makes them much healthier. When they get too much deuterium, they start spewing out reactive oxygen and causing damage to the tissues. They also become inefficient at making ATP. So they're, they, 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 they use more, they use up more energy in making ATP and they produce these uh, nasty uh, reactive molecules that are going to damage the cells and damage the mitochondria. So, you want to have very healthy mitochondria if you're going to climb Mount, Mount Everest. And the way you yeah. get that is by eating uh, foods that are low in deuterium. And in particular, these branch chain fatty acids, which are so cool. And we can, we can talk about that later, but. 
Did you ask so a question I, or are you yeah, completely stuck? Yeah, I'm, there's so many. There's so many. I know you can just dive in and I love it. I love it. So <laughs> to let me back up, kind of the conventional wisdom on anything endurance is going to be to carb load, right? Like if, if somebody's going to run a marathon, that the the what they're told or need to do is have very high carb input. So what you're saying, what the study is saying is that – that did not work, at least on this first five attempts by yes. the person that's trying to Mount Everest. But by following Dr. Boros's uh, protocol with the deuterium lowering, deuterium depleting methods of animal fats and increasing the the fatty acid profile, he was or they were able to climb Everest uh, successfully. That's right. Successfully on the sixth try. Supple- try. Yes sixth try without supplemental oxygen and so exactly by, which is amazing so by utilizing something that's that extreme we can almost better reverse engineer the process of metabolism right by seeing mm-hmm. those extremes you can understand it better and so the the deuterium can we go into that just a little bit more to understand uh based off of how something as s- small right as Really tiny. And a slightly different form makes that big of an impact. Yes. And that was something that was talked about in that paper that he uh, he, that he attached when he sent me the email. Um, A a really good paper talking about um, the metabolism and how the deuterium gets around and this point about the um, mitochondria. And and so the thing is, so the mitochondria, you know, they are the guys who make the ATP. And there's lots and lots of them inside cells. And muscles have tons of them and, and neurons. Muscles and neurons have lots and lots of mitochondria. And each one is busy making ATP. And uh, it, it does so by the energy, uh, the force that it uses to make the ATP rel- relies on hydrogen, protons in particular. Protons are positively charged. They're just, an, um, you know, they only have a proton. <laughs> a proton and an electron make hydrogen. And when you take away the electron, you have just the proton. The proton is pumped into this intermembrane space. The mitochondria have this matrix inside with all these wiggles. I don't know if you've seen pictures of mitochondria. And then there's the intermembrane space, which surrounds that matrix. And that's like it's, 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 it's outside boundary. And, and it pumps protons into that intermembrane space. And then those protons come back. And there's a proton motive force, which is because the, there's too many protons inside the membrane and too few in the matrix. So the protons want to come out. That's just trying to adjust the equilibrium. So they come piling through these ATPase pumps, which are incredibly uh, fancy uh, enzymes that are able to make ATP from ADP and at the same time uh, convert oxygen to water and use those protons to make the water from the oxygen. So that's a really critical step um, in the in the synthesis of ATP, which is the energy source of the cell. So uh, when you put deuterons into that intermembrane space, they come, they're clumsy big guys, they come through and they wreck the pumps basically. They get, they get stuck in there, they block things, they can even kill the enzyme so that it has to be made again. Like that one's dead, just get rid of it, make another one, you know? So the deuterium uh, messes up the pumps. And when you mess up the pumps, then you've got mitochondria that aren't working well. And then you, you either have to get rid of the deuterium or just kill that entire mitochondria and start over, you know? So there's a tremendous, uh, and so mitochondrial dysfunction is a, a major factor in many, many diseases, lots of neurodegenerative diseases, autism, you know, um, rheumatoid arthritis, all of these diseases have issues with the mitochondria not working properly in the cell. And I think that a primary force behind that is too much deuterium in the mitochondria. So Dr. Boros and I connected over uh, cancer. And so the the work of cancer being a metabolic disease or metabolic in origin, uh, the deuterium piece fit perfectly. And as I had heard, uh, you know, a lot of his talks and uh, we connected and he's been on a a few times, uh, talked to him regularly because he is so passionate about this topic. Like, I I mean, he's dedicated his life to deuteronomics. Um, So, with with that, what is the implication do you see from something on the extreme right of endurance of uh, and I'm, I'm curious if y'all have looked into like the free diving, especially with you being in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. I would think that would be oh, yeah. something to be very interesting. Free diving, deuterium depletion. That what actually wasn't my idea. That was Kelly's, the, the podcast producers. Uh, when when I was reading the the study highlights to him, but. What what can we take away from that extreme of of climbing Everest and the extreme of, of cancer? 
Yeah, I know. So that's that's the thing. And there's this guy, Somal, Somalia, I don't know how to pronounce it, S-O-M-L-Y-A-I. Yeah, he's. I've read his one of his books, and they're very technical. But it was interesting because he went through all these cases of cancer patients that he's treated, and and their outcomes. And he just showed a consistent story of, of these patients outliving their life expectancy because of the deuterium depleted water that they were taking regularly. So that's very interesting. And actually, I drink it every day. This is a, uh, a mixture of two thirds regular water and one third light water, which is ten parts per million. So I'm trying to aim for something sort of like what you might find from glacier melt. I don't want to drink straight okay. light water because that's that's too low. You know, everything wants to be right. somewhere in the middle. So I, I buy the light water and then I mix it with regular water and I have a glass every day. That's just kind of my little deuterium depleted therapy that I that I take and and um, and I think it's it's working well. I mean, I feel good. Of course, I I don't I don't have any issues. I don't have health issues. So, but um, but it, it feels good. So I I, uh, I believe in it. Do- do do you feel that you know anecdotally that that is making a difference even even for you um, by using using a lower deuterium water? I think so. I mean, it's hard to tell, right? It, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, I know that um, there's a paper that was amazing um, that showed that it, this was to me really really this is actually what inspired me to start taking it because I have a, a history of depression in my family. I mean, my 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 mom. Uh, many of my siblings, including me here and there, you know, I, I, we get by, but we get depressed, you know, we easily get depressed, yeah. my kids too. So it's like, uh, it's something in our genes, I think. And so um, this paper, um, they, they looked at the level of deuterium in the drinking water, in the regular drinking water for the 50 states of the United States. They had information on that, which I was surprised to find out. They could get uh, the average, you know, level, and, and you have different levels of drinking water in different areas in in part, it has to do with elevation and it has to do with latitude. So if you're up north, you tend to have low deuterium water. In fact, the glacier water, the way this was figured out was by the Russian Russian scientists who were looking at these people in Siberia who had incredibly good health and lived over, over 100. A lot of them were over 100 years old and still alive. And they were like, what's going on with these people? Because they didn't have a particularly good diet, not a lot of fresh green vegetables because they had a very short growing season. You know, they ate a lot of meat. And of course, they ate a lot of animal based fats, which was probably helping them as well. Uh, but but their water was low in deuterium because it was the glacier melt coming from from the ice. And so when 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 water melts from ice, the deuterium stays behind in the in the solid form. And the same thing is true when water uh, leaves uh, liquid to gas. And, and this is actually really critical for how we end up how the fats end up with such low deuterium It's not just um, because they're fats. It's because of where they come from and in particular where the hydrogen comes from that's in those fats. And this is just super interesting because the gut microbes, um, the many of the gut microbes can make hydrogen gas. They extract hydrogen from organic molecules and they make H2 hydrogen gas. And, you know, you get bloated. A lot of people have issues with bloating, mm-hmm. uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, that the gases are piling up. And methane gas, you know, the cows, they're worried about the cows causing global climate change because they release all that methane gas. Um, the hydrogen gas is produced first, and that acts as a, as a reducing agent to grab carbon dioxide out of the air and reduce it to methane. And methane gas is CH4. So you have two H, H2, H2 to get together with carbon makes CH4, which is methane. And that methane is going to be incredibly low in deuterium. Because the microbes know how to make hydrogen gas that's extract is to keep the deuterium out of the hydrogen gas. And it's partly hmm. through the cleverness of those enzymes, but also partly because deuterium likes to stay in the liquid form compared to the gas. So, so when the raindrops come down from, from the sky at the equator, the water evaporates more quickly than it does if they're coming down up north, just because it's hotter, right? So you lose more water from the raindrop as it comes down. And the water that you lose is in, is low in deuterium because of this property that deuterium tends to stay in the liquid form. So by the time the raindrop gets down to the ground, it's got high deuterium. It, lo- it lost the water that was low in deuterium, okay. which makes it high. So this is why at the equator, the water, the rain at the equator has higher deuterium. And it can be pretty st- substantial. Well, it's, it's on the order of like 155 versus 135. So up north, you could have 135 parts per million. It's not that big a difference, actually. And that's what surprises me, that it makes such a big difference. So in the United yeah. States, you have the northern states have lower uh, deuterium than the southern states. And the, and the worst, uh, the highest deuterium is in sort of the southeast. 
And probably because that's also low elevation, both low elevation and uh, low latitude. They get more deuterium in the water. And that's also where the depression is the worst. So they did, they, they did a, uh, they figured out the average depression rate in all these 50 states. And then they figured out the average um, level of deuterium in the drinking water, in the municipal drinking water of all the 50 states. And they, and they plotted these two things on a, on a curve and they showed a remarkable correlation with a p value of something like 0. 0.00 something or other. It was very low probability of being uh, random by chance. Um, that low deuterium drinking water was correlated with less depression, which I thought was just amazing wow. that it was just that little bit of difference in the, in the level of the drinking water. So that inspired me to think that maybe I should try to pretend that I'm drinking glacier water <laughs> once a day, a glass of glacier water. And I, th- and I think it's been helpful. I, th- I think that is fascinating. And it, it par- almost perfectly parallels a lot of the work that uh, you know Dr. Chris Palmer's done with brain energy as a, as a psychiatrist that's looking into utilizing a ketogenic diet to deal mm. with a lot of the psychological issues. So I, that's, you know, you, you made that circle back for me. I think that's incredible. Uh, something I've been doing. So w- what got, you know, as, as we've talked before, is my son's stage four cancer diagnosis when he was five is what's led me to mm-hmm. trying to figure out what, what we do, right? What went wrong and how do we overcome? And so something I've done is really, really, really focused in on the water. And I think that's probably the biggest miss when we talk about like blue zones and things that they're not talking about the water. I think the water may be uh, one of the most important factors um, of, of what's going on, but I, I digress with that. But what I've, I've really focused on is actually been using uh, distill- distilling water uh, mm. and what's left over is absolutely horrifying. Uh, so mm. the first step of what I've been doing was uh, it's a cheap, uh, distiller that I got off of Amazon just to kind of get the bulk of it up. And what's left over is this smelly, nasty, uh, discolored grossness. Like it, it's so nasty. That's what's left and, behind when you distill the water, right? We take away the yes, distilled the, water, on, what's on, left behind. Interesting. Yeah, just gross. Yes. yes. And it can, and it doesn't look nasty. This is not cloudy water. This is just straight out of the faucet that looks clear, looks clean, has no yeah, smell. But what's left over is just really, That's very really disturbing. And this is regular tap I run water, it through right? Tap water regular tap live. water in Arkansas. Yep. That's really, really and, interesting. Wow. And so I'll run it through again uh, through another, a really, uh, a really nice uh, distiller and set up. And then uh, I, I store it actually in this huge copper uh, <laughs> vessel, 100% copper vessel. And that is what Lander drinks, uh, my son. And I will take that water. And I love that you pointed out to start to wrap this all together, that you're adding the deuterium depleted water. I've got the 18 part per million uh, that I mix with that water. So th- what he drinks is that whole process. Uh, and then he gets mi- uh, electrolytes and stuff. So it's, he, he has his minerals there, but I use the deuterium depleted water as part of his everyday drinking uh, a- as a mix to that. So what, what are your thoughts as I went through <laughs> that process? Wow. That is interesting. So I, I don't want to understand, is he drinking the distilled water? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. And then the stuff that's left behind you throw it away. <laughs> yes, we throw it away. Yeah, <laughs> I see. Yeah, great. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's right. Put the minerals back in because that's the problem with distilling water is you don't have any minerals, and the minerals in the water are important. We, we've messed up our water so badly in this country that it's really hard to get it back to where it should be. You know, and of course, yeah. there's often glyphosate in the water, which I find horrendous, and that's another problem. And, and the uh, glyphosate, the microplastics, the parasites, uh, I mean, yes. I feel like there's this wide realm. And, and as I was going through how do we get clean water, I've really come to if you have a very clean source of spring water, that's probably yes. your best bet. But I don't right. know how how that is. And then when you take that perfectly clean spring water, put it in a plastic bottle, and then it sits I on know, a, the plastic on bottles a truck. Like, <laughs> hello. Right? And then it gets hot and it leaches in. It, it just seems like it defeats the purpose. So I'm most comfortable with the distilling the way we have. That, just that's quite I know fancy. That really is a lot of effort. And I think that's really cool that you do that. That's so amazing. And uh, well, yeah. I, I mean, you know, we do, we do what we have to for, for our kiddos, but I love how you're tying that into this, the depression. I wasn't expecting us to go there, uh, but I think that is so 
prevalent to the greater picture of why why is keto working? I feel mm-hmm. like it's the deuterium personally. Why is carnivore helping? I think it's the deuterium depletion. I do too. So I do too. What what are you seeing on the glyphosate deuterium connection? I know you alluded to that before we started recording. Yeah, I know, but what I haven't is, talked about it yet. <laughs> I've alluded God. to it. That's all. Yeah, it's so, so interesting. Yeah, and I was amazed because when, when, as I learned about deuterium and how it's managed in the body and everything, everything that manages deuterium is wrecked by glyphosate. It is so amazing. It's really, really scary. I already knew this, you know, so I immediately linked it to glyphosate when Laszlo told me about it. And, and um, and then finding those enzymes in the in the uh, microbes that produce this incredibly wonderful hydrogen gas that's got very little deuterium. It's down by 80%. So you throw away 80% of the deuterium when you make that hydrogen gas. And then you bring it back into organic matter and it becomes those short chain fatty acids that the uh, butyrate, propionate and acetate. And then those things go into the whole system and become very special to the, to the host, like the, the human uh, host understands the cells understand that this stuff is gold you know and glyphosate messes up the production of those short chain fatty acids and it does so it's quite interesting because it starts with the uh, bifidobacteria you probably know about bifidobacteria because they've yes. kind of been in the news they're actually there's uh, articles talking about uh, there's a sabine hazan sabine hazan is a uh, is a doctor who has uh, looked into the gut microbe and and its response to um, covid 19 and also to the vaccines and she's finding that it gets bifidobacteria get killed by the virus by the covid virus they become depleted and um and bifidobacteria also get killed by glyphosate there's papers that they single out bifidobacteria and lactobacillus there's a paper very recently i think 2023 that i talked about it in a paper i wrote in 2012 but there was another paper that came out recently by some other researchers showing it experimentally uh, bifidobacteria and lactobacillus are very sensitive to glyphosate. So they get killed off by glyphosate and then other microbes develop, but but bifidos are really, really important for that whole system that makes that hydrogen gas and makes that those short chain fatty acids. That whole chain of events depends upon those bifidos. And the bifidos actually, they break down complex carbohydrates and then they convert those into simple molecules. And then the bifidos are not the ones that make the hydrogen gas. They actually don't have the capability to make hydrogen gas, but there's other bacteria who take over on that task. And that's the firmicutes. So the firmicutes um, take those short, those small molecules that the bifidos made and turn them into, and extract hydrogen from them to make hydrogen gas. And then there's yet other, other, and I think, uh, I think the, um, Firmicutes can also do this other task of turning that hydrogen gas back into organic matter. So there's a whole hydrogen cycling process that goes on in the gut where hydrogen gas is constantly being made and it's low in deuterium, you know, only 20%. And then it's turned into methane, you know, or into acetate. Those are both um, derived from carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas. So the microbes are are making uh, inorganic molecules, hydrogen gas, and then there's carbon dioxide that comes in from the air. And the carbon dioxide and the hydrogen go get together and make organic molecules. And this is something that microbes can do and human cells cannot do. So we depend upon our microbes to make these beautiful organic molecules that are very low in deuterium through that distillation process. It's so interesting. And then those those small molecules get turned into all kinds of other things, especially like into fats. So those, um, those short chain fatty acids are linked together to make long chain fatty acids. And that's why they are so low in deuterium because they come from there's such a short path from the hydrogen gas to those fats that they end up with low deuterium. And the butyrate is so important for the gut because the, the, the lining of the gut, the, the colonocytes, they love butyrate. That's their favorite food. And they expect to get it from the microbes. But but when you block that first step with the uh, bifidobacteria, the butyrate goes way down. And glyphosate also raises the pH of the gut. That's been shown experimentally. And it's been shown experimentally mm. that it reduces the supply of acetate in the gut. And low acetate is linked to autism. Autistic kids have low low acetate compared to normal kids. And that's because these acid-loving bacteria don't thrive when the pH gets too high. That's the acid-base thing. Glyphosate raises the pH of the gut such that those microbes are not happy. And so they're, they're not thriving and therefore butyrate's not being made. And therefore the colonocytes are upset because they're not getting the right kind of food. And of course, they're getting too much deuterium in their mitochondria and they're getting sick. And then you end up with colon cancer, for example, or various kinds of, you know, Crohn's disease and that sort of thing. Inflammatory bowel. 
Fascinating. That's absolutely fascinating. So to I, the pH aspect is really interesting, and I, it, I think it just clicked for me. Uh, pH standing for potential of hydrogen, is it correct? And that has yeah. to do with acidity or alkalinity. It, yeah, uh, acid versus base is H plus and OH minus. Those are the two pieces that make water. And the acid base, you know, there's too many H's or too many H pluses or too many OH minuses will get you a you know, different pH. So the pH is, is high when there's lots of OH minuses and it's low when there's lots of H pluses. How, uh, all right, that's just, it's absolutely fascinating how, how important something seemingly so small and, and insignificant is and how it impacts literally everything. So I know that that glyphosate and autism are a big, big focus for you. How, how does deuterium affect autism do you think is is that a a role in there because i know there's some more connections say sulfur i find that fascinating yes. that that connection very i can fascinating. talk about that because that connects to deuterium everything seems to connect to deuterium and there's also the collagen issue so um all of it <laughs> all of it goes to deuterium it's so interesting so um i don't know which one to start with first but the sulfate so i identified sulfate uh, mismanagement in autism very early on before i knew about glyphosate I had been reading, I'd been reading about autism. I really wanted to figure out what was causing the autism epidemic. That was my passion uh, starting in 2007. And I, uh, and I was looking at all kinds of different possible toxic exposures because I was sure it had something to do with toxicity. And I didn't look at glyphosate because, you know, Roundup is safe. It's all over the place. Nobody worries about it, right? So I didn't worry about it but until I heard this lecture by, and it was one of my uh, epiphany moments, like the one with deuterium. And that happened in uh, 2012 was when I happened to hear a lecture by uh, Don Huber, Professor Don Huber. He's over 80 years old and he's still active. He's a great guy. And um, and he, he gave this two hour lecture and I was like, oh, my God, this is it. I was like, just so sure because I'd been reading for five years. I'd been studying autism and looking at all these things and striking out. And it worked so beautifully that I was just really confident that I'd found the answer. And then I spent, you know, I have my book over here. <laughs> I'll put this up. Toxic Legacy. Um, Toxic. Great book. Yeah, how the weed killer glyphosate is destroying our health and the environment. I'm quite convinced that uh, glyphosate is the primary cause. Not the only thing that causes autism, but the primary cause of the epidemic. I'm quite sure at this point. I, I would I would swear on a stack of Bibles, I'm that sure, you yeah. know, <laughs> because the evidence yeah. is so strong. And, and glyphosate causes a lot of, um, uh, screws up a lot of things, really messes up a lot of things. And the things it messes up are the things that are messed up in autism. So it's like a hand in glove. It's so perfect. And um, and then they all relate to deuterium. So, you know, it's, so I'm sure that um, deuterium is a problem in autism. And, um, what what is that sulfur deuterium connection? Is is that is that mm -hmm. relatively complicated or, or not too bad? Let me try about? it because it also connects to the collagen. <laughs> and and oh, I should say it. glyphosate's mechanism of toxicity, I believe, is its ability to substitute for glycine during protein synthesis. That is a unique property of glyphosate. I don't know of any other uh, molecule that has that property. There are other molecules that substitute for other amino acids and cause disease but not glycine. So this is unique. And I think it's uh, diabolical and insidious, cumulative, I mean, really, really nasty. The glyphosate goes into your proteins and sticks around in your body. And it'll, and then when the protein is broken down, the glyphosate is released and it goes into another protein. So it's constantly wandering around your body, getting into proteins and messing them up. And certain proteins heavily depend on certain glycines to work properly. And if glyphosate hits one of those glycines, that protein's dead in the water, can't do its job. And I've identified which proteins, in fact, that glyphosate disrupts. And, uh, and so collagen is uh, the most common protein in the body. A third of our proteins are collagen molecules. And the collagen is, is produced and folded in the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, and then it's pushed out to the uh, out exterior of the cell, and it goes around the cell and forms this collagen matrix. It hooks onto, you know, surrounds the cell, and then hooks onto the, what's called heparin sulfate, very sulfated proteoglycans, these things have big names, but <laughs> heparin sulfate in particular attaches to the collagen and the heparin sulfate gels the water. It, it turns the water into gel. And, and this is Gerald Pollack's work. And I've read a lot about, I know him personally, and he's another one of my big fans. So uh, I have this list of three, really, <laughs> Don Huber, Gerald Pollack, and then um, Laszlo Boros. So um, they're my, my gods, you know, if you will, because they, each of them 
was a metamorphosis in my life. So, so Gerald was talking about gelled water outside the cell and how it pushes the protons out. And I think those protons are deuterium depleted because of this whole issue of the, the deuterium stays behind in the more solid form. So it stays behind in the ice, it stays behind in the gel, it stays behind in the liquid, and the hydrogen gas has the lowest deuterium. So you get to low deuterium by making it into a, a gas, you know, or making it less solid, a uh, little, little lower the deuterium. So the um, deuterium is pushed out from the gel. The gel depends upon the sulfate, and the sulfate depends upon sulf sulfation enzymes working properly. And glyphosate messes up many of the enzymes involved in sulfation. And that is, I think, because of critical glycine residues in those enzymes. You know, I, I, there's absolutely essential, there's these motifs like GXGXXG motif, three glycines that occurs at places where these enzymes bind phosphate. And so I talk in my book about um, glyphosate being especially damaging to enzymes that bind phosphate at a site where glycine is highly conserved. And glyphosate gets in place of that glycine, takes up the space where the phosphate's supposed to go, and now phosphate doesn't fit anymore and the enzyme doesn't work. And so, in particular, for example, PAPS synthase, phosphoadenosyl phosphosulfate, PAPS synthase, super important enzyme, in, in, certainly everywhere in the body, but in the gut, the PAPS synthase is responsible for converting sulfate into an activated form of sulfate. It kind of mixes the sulfate with an ATP molecule to give it energy, and it allows that then that it becomes a universal sulfate donor. So PAPS carries around a sulfate that it can hook onto anything. It hooks onto all kinds of different molecules. And those molecules depend upon that sulfate uh, in order to be shipped in the blood because those are typically fat-soluble molecules, so like cholesterol and vitamin D and the, and the hormones, testosterone and estrogen, and also um, the aromatic amino acids, which are also disrupted by glyphosate. They all depend upon, and, and, and hormones like um, serotonin and melatonin, all these things get sulfated. And often they're made in the gut, sulfated, and shipped out into the blood with a sulfate attached to them. So cholesterol sulfate, vitamin D sulfate, that allows them to just wander freely in the blood. And actually what they do is they get into the membranes of the lipid particles, the LDL particles, for example. So people have high LDL, they get put on a statin drug, right? Um, the LDL wants to have sulfate sticking out around its uh, around its borders, which it gets by virtue of putting these fat soluble molecules like vitamin D and cholesterol into the membrane, and then the sulfate sticking out, and the sulfate gels the water around the the lipid particle, which protects it. That gelled water is is exclusion zone water. This is what uh, a term that Gerald Pollack uses: exclusion zone water. It excludes um, solutes, which means that whatever gunk is floating around in the blood can't touch that LDL particle because it's protected. It's kind of like a, a Superman shield, you know? It protects that yeah. um, that lipid particle from oxidation damage, from glycation damage, keeps it safe, keeps it healthy. The sulfate does that, but you don't have enough sulfate because the sulfate's being, the glyphosate's messing up the ability to put that sulfate onto that cholesterol. And now, the, and now because the cholesterol can't be sulfated, it's not water soluble. It has to go inside those LDL particles and the liver has to make more. And then you get high LDL, you get put on a statin drug. Fascinating. Uh, again. Yep. Um, so two questions, collagen supplementation. I can almost kind of sit here as I don't understand everything and make an argument for it and actually against it. Would it potentially have a higher deuterium content? Well, uh, it, yeah, in, in well, that's that's an interesting point, but it'll also probably have glyphosate unless it's organic. There's glyphosate in collagen. Okay. Because so, it has tons of glycine. Co collagen, I didn't mention that. GXY, 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 every third amino acid is a glycine. Huge swaths of collagen has tons of glycine. And so glyphosate has lots of chances to m make mischief. And when those, gly those glycines are critical, you can have a, a, mu a mutation in one glycine in collagen. One molecule, one, one of the um, residues in, in collagen can be mutated to something else, not glycine, and you can have really serious diseases come out of that just with one glycine mutation. But glyphosate is able to, to, to substitute for any of them. And depending upon where it substitutes, it's going to mess things up. The, the, the crystal, the beautiful triple helix structure that collagen forms when it's folding uh, won't work if the glycines are substituted by glyphosate. Hmm. So the collagen becomes so, impaired. You know, it doesn't work properly. 
do you do you have a, a thought on using the supplements then? Uh, if, organic. If they were grass, if organic. They were grass fed, grass finished, organic. Yeah, w- yeah, I think so. Way. I mean, I think collagen is really important. In fact, because it traps deuterium, you see, it traps deuterium in a safe place. That's the whole point because it's outside the cell. It's keeping it away from, it's sequestering it away from um, the mitochondria. So it actually serves a useful purpose in tra- trapping deuterium. And actually, yeah, it's quite fascinating. There, is, there are these uh, enzymes called uh, prolyl isomerase. Uh, really interesting. And this is stuff I'm still trying to figure out. Um, and also, Laszlo and I are kind of trying to figure it out together. But there are these isomerases. Laszlo said to me that all isomerases are involved with deuterium management. And I think he's probably right. And isomerases are enzymes that um, they, you have two mo- molecules that have exactly the same content, like they have the same chemical formula. But the, but the atoms are arranged differently between the two. And the isomerase converts one into the other and back again. It's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And in the case of proline, proline is actually, there's two isoforms of proline that are kind of mirror image of each other, like the hands, like the gloves. You know, they're, they're sort of the same, but they're mirror image. And, um, and the proline, proline isomerase converts them back and forth between those two mirror image guys. So when you have a whole bunch of proline, so <laughs> collagen has a ton of proline and a ton of glycine, both of those, really a lot. Most of the collagen is proline and glycine. And, and the proline, uh, when, it, when that isomerase is active, the proline flips back and forth between those two forms in the molecule. So, to, so in the ER, this enzyme is expressed, this isomerase, and you have these big collagen molecules that are trying to fold. They need to make their crystal structure, you know, that beautiful triple helix. And they're trying to fold. And, they, and while they're trying to fold, they're wiggling back and forth with all those prolines moving back and flipping back and forth. It increases the rate at which the proline flips by a thousand fold compared to not having that enzyme. So the proline molecule is kind of stirring up the water is what I think. This is very theoretical yeah. and it hasn't been proven. But proline, it turns out proline is able to trap deuterium. And it's quite amazing. I found an article. I found a, uh, a thesis, 1943 thesis really interesting because it talked about proline having a unique property among all the amino acids. It's the only one of being able to trap deuterium. If it gets a deuterium stuck onto the proline, it won't let go. It holds onto it essentially forever. It's very hard to get it off. And so mm-hmm. you can picture the, the collagen molecule in the ER, the water base, you know, these prolines are flipping around back and forth because of this enzyme. And they're kind of stirring up the water and trying to get, trying to hit upon a deuterium atom, I think. And if they catch one, it sticks and then it stays forever. So they're basically, you know, trolling through the water, looking for deuteriums and trapping them. I think this is completely wacko theory, if you want. It's like a wild idea. Um, but I think it must be true because it just makes so much sense. So then the, the collagen traps the deuterium. It's cleaning up the water in the ER to get rid of the deuterium because all the other proteins don't want deuterium. They want to be deuterium free as much as possible. And so the collagen's job, in a way, I think, is to strip out all the deuterium, go find deuterium molecules, stick them onto the prolines, and then put it outside the door so that it won't affect the mitochondria, trap the deuterium in the collagen. And of course, with glyphosate messing up collagen, it's not going to work very well to do that. And that's going to cause more deuterium to be sticking around in wrong places, such as the ER, and, and that's going to be trouble too. So I think that's another aspect of how glyphosate's messing up um, the body's ability to manage the deuterium. That's incredible. Uh, that that's incredible. So, to follow follow up on that and then circle back just a little bit to, do you think that we are experiencing a uh, sulfur deficiency? I do, I do. Yeah, and it's really a sulfate deficiency. And so, a problem is a lot of people that have sulfur, sulfur sensitivity these days. They avoid sulfur containing foods because they irritate their gut, and I think that's because of glyphosate disrupting those enzymes. I think glyphosate disrupts the enzyme that converts sulfite to sulfate, and it also yeah. disrupts the enzyme that converts sulfate to PAPS, which is the universal sulfate donor. Both of those enzymes have tremendous, well-matched glyphosate susceptibility motifs that I define in my book. You know, they're both susceptible. And in fact, in E. coli, it's been shown that those enzymes are suppressed in E. coli uh, by glyphosate. And so and E. coli, there's a wonderful study that looked at very comprehensive, looking at all these different enzymes that E. coli produce and seeing which ones are suppressed by glyphosate. And those were suppressed. The one, so the ones that make methionine from, 
from inorganic sulfur. So that's going to be methionine deficiency, which is also a huge problem. And, and, and autism has methionine deficiency associated with it. And then the ones that make sulfate from sulfide and the ones that make PAPs from sulfate, I think all of those are disrupted by glyphosate. And so what happens mm-hmm. when you eat sulfur containing foods is you get sulfite, which is extremely reactive and very toxic. You don't want sulfite to be hanging around. Normally, the microbes have these wonderful enzymes that whisk it away right away and either reduce it to methionine or oxidize it to sulfate. And all those enzymes are messed up by glyphosate. So sulfide becomes toxic and you become sensitive to sulfur. So I think sulfur sensitivity is often tied to glyphosate exposure. Wow. Wow. Yeah, because that was that honestly was one of the common allergies when I was working on the a- the ambulance that you'd hear was uh, sulfur drugs were were mm. extremely common uh, to hear that that was that was an allergy. Well, as always, any time I, I uh, visit with you, I've got to go back and re listen <laughs> to try to absorb it because there's so much incredible information. But I think the the biggest takeaway is that. Deuterium's a big deal, and glyphosate is absolutely destroying a lot of 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 ways. It's uh, detrimental for so many different reasons, and so just I, I just want to thank you. I can't recommend Toxic Legacy enough. I think you've done a phenomenal job in writing that book. Uh, as you know, I think all of your books are great, but that one mm-hmm. being the newest, uh, you you did an amazing job, and I just want to thank you. Thank you for taking the time with me. Uh, you know now now multiple times and and helping me try to understand because i feel like it is all so tied together it is yeah it's so fascinating of course you can tell i love biology and i can't believe after so many years of studying it that i still discover new things you know that surprise me so it's it's a great hobby if you get if you get enough biology into your head that you can build more it becomes a an obsession you know an addiction even so I love it. I love studying biology and I, I want to understand everything. And of course, that's impossible, but I'm, I'm, I'm making headway. You are. Well, you, you've been a blessing, my friend. Thank you so much again for the time and the, the wisdom and the work that you put in. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. I enjoyed it tremendously. So, Thank you for joining us on Sewing Prosperity. Be sure to follow along across the social media platforms, including YouTube, and be sure to go to sewingprosperity.com.